Good evening, everyone. I want to uh, welcome you all to the next edition of our guest speaker series here at the Holland Land Office Museum. Uh, nice to see a good turnout again for our, our program. Uh, very excited today as we have uh, Derek Pratt from the Erie Canal Museum out in Syracuse who came all the way out to speak to us today. Uh, so he's going to be talking about the importance of the Erie Canal to the Underground Railroad. Uh, so uh, very interested to uh, hear about that. Uh, I do want to say thank you to uh, GoArt in New York State uh, as this program is partially funded through a DEC grant uh, that we were awarded this year. So uh, thank you to them. It helps us bring in speakers from farther distances than uh, maybe normally we could. So uh, I want to thank you, Derek, for coming out again and take it away. All right. Thanks for having me. Good to be here. Uh, yeah, always wanted to be here. The Holland Land Company was pretty important in the history of the Erie Canal, so glad to have gotten a chance to check this out. Uh, so, uh, yeah, this is Pathway of Resistance. We're going to look at uh, the history of the Erie Canal as it related to the abolition movement. And uh, this is actually, this talk is actually based off of a walking tour uh, that we do at the museum uh, of downtown Syracuse. Um, and a little background on that walking tour. Um, we began it in uh, fall of 2020. Um, so for years, everyone in the Erie Canal was very aware um, the Erie Canal had this strong connection uh, to the Underground Railroad, uh, black history and everything, but we were always like, ah, that seems like a lot of work. Let's not look into it. Somebody else's job. Wait till somebody else writes the book, you know, as so often happens. Uh, and then June of 2020 happened. Uh, America was, was reckoning uh, with, with race uh, after the, the murders of George Floyd and, and so on. Um, so the museum, we saw a lot of other museums, they were making statements, uh, you know, changing their social media profile pictures and stuff to be black uh, and everything. And, and we were like, what should we do? And we realized we hadn't really done anything. We had been for years just waiting for someone else to do the research. Uh, so uh, we committed in June of 2020 uh, to start looking into, the, into black history on the Erie Canal. And the first result was the Pathways of Resistance walking tour um, that, that this is based on. So really proud of this. And because it is relatively new research and it has gone neglected for so long, um, this talk and the, the walking tour changes pretty much every time we do it as we discover new things. Uh, so, I'll say, that's the background to this. Uh, so, I did a recording of this in I think like February of 2021. This will hopefully be a bit different. Uh, so you're hopefully getting some value out of this. Anywho, uh, we'll get started. A few quick things. Uh, the sources for this, we used a lot of contemporary newspaper accounts. We also worked with the National Abolition Hall of Fame, which is in Peterborough, New York, right outside of Syracuse. Uh, they were very helpful, uh, as well as the Harriet Tubman uh, House down in Auburn. And um, we worked with the National uh, Parks Service as well. Um, they gave us uh, advice on terminology surrounding slavery. Uh, specifically, going to use the term enslaved person rather than slave, gives agency uh, to these people. They are defined by more than just their status uh, under the institution of slavery and freedom seeker rather than something like fugitive slave or escaped slave. Again, giving them agency, they were actively attempting to take their freedom. So, all that said, let's get started. Uh, and one of our big goals with this is kind of to blow up some of the myths that. Um, we oftentimes here in, in New York especially have. So when you think about New York and its relationship to the institution of slavery, how do you think of New York State? Anyone? Yes? Pathway to freedom. Pathway to freedom, right. That's what I grew up in. I, I grew up in Chittenango, New York. Uh, and we, we will end up becoming a pathway of freedom, for sure. Um, but New York also has a long history with slavery itself. So just a little background, I think it's important uh, to talk about the history of slavery uh, in New York. Uh, in 1619, first 20 enslaved Africans arrived in Jamestown, first in modern America, uh, what will eventually become America. Less than a decade later, in 1626, 
11 Angolans and Congolese will arrive in uh, New Amsterdam at the time, will eventually become New York City, of course. Um, they are the first enslaved people here in New York State. As you can see, history of slavery goes back quite a ways here in New York. Uh, the Dutch themselves are very heavily involved in slave trade, but after the British take it over from the Dutch, New York is going to become a major hub of the slave trade. In fact, uh, at the time of the Revolution, New York City has the second most per capita enslaved people behind only Charleston, South Carolina. So it is a major center uh, for slavery. Uh, and we're going to see later, by 1810, a third of all rural New York households will have an enslaved person uh, living in them. Uh, so it's going to continue after British rule as well. Uh, and New York is also the largest holding slaveholding state north of the Mason-Dixon line. Um, and we often think of slavery usually as a southern problem. That's where the bad stuff happened, right? That's what we often think of. Uh, enslaved people in New York are often thought of as kind of dock workers and everything. But northern slavery could be just as brutal. In New York City, for instance, uh, the British pass a law saying that it's illegal for more than three enslaved people at a time to meet together, uh, punishment of which is whipping. Uh, and in the 1740s, um, 12 black people, uh, both free and enslaved, are burned at the stake in New York City. Uh, so the horrors of slavery extend north as well. Uh, but things start to change as the American Revolution happens. Um, 1781, the state offers enslaved people who serve in the Revolutionary uh, Army freedom after the war. And um, research by the New York City Historic Society has found that at the Battle of Yorktown, about one third of, so might be a quarter, I might have misspoken there, uh, of the uh, New York State Militia is made up of black soldiers, both free and enslaved. And, and following the war, of course, uh, we fight this war for independence, uh, for the, the idea that all men are created equal, right? So New York kind of looks itself in the mirror and says, we seem to be treating some men like they are not equal. Uh, so 1785, uh, the New York Manumission Society is founded. Uh, notably, Alexander Hamilton is one of the main founding members, but also Governor Morris. Um, some of you may be familiar with, he, uh, he actually writes, physically wrote the Constitution. He was on the uh, Committee for Style, uh, representing Pennsylvania there. He signed the Declaration of Independence as a New Yorker, moved back here, he lived outside of New York City. Um, Anyway, Governor Morris is actually going to speak the most at the Constitutional Convention. He's arguing against slavery. Longtime New Yorker, he is sometimes credited with coming up with the idea for the Erie Canal as well after a conversation with Ben Franklin. I don't think that story is true at all, but anyway, he does end up becoming the first president of the New York State Canal Commission and writes the first report in 1810 uh, recommending a canal connecting Lake Erie to the Hudson River. Um, and the New York Maine Mission Society, anyway, uh, they advocate for the gradual emancipation of slavery in New York. Um, and I really point this out, especially Governor Morris's story, because we often think about, when we talk about things like the abolition movement and, and fighting for things like civil rights, uh, it's often thought of as People are often excused for, oh, well, they didn't think like that back then. Um, everyone was just in favor of slavery. But they weren't all in favor of slavery. From the start of the United States, there were people like Governor Morris advocating against slavery, and people in incredibly powerful positions. Uh, Morris is going to end up a senator. So anyway, uh, New York Navy Mission Society advocates for gradual abolition. In 1799, they are going to get it. Sort of. Uh, the Act for the Gradual Abolition of Slavery. This act frees a whopping zero people. Instead, it redefines enslaved people as indentured servants. Um, so essentially, if you're born before July 7th, 
July 4th, don't know how I messed that one up, uh, 1799. Um, you can't be sold anymore, but you still have to continue to do unpaid labor for the rest of your life. Uh, if you were born after July 4th, 1799, you're still an indentured servant, but only uh, if you are a woman for 25 years and a man for 28 years. So essentially, this law says slavery will be outlawed in New York in 25 more years. Sort of. Um, granted, if you're born in 1810, for instance, uh, to an enslaved mother, you've got another 25 to 28 years. Uh, Sojourner Truth is actually um, born under this and will uh, just make her way to Ohio and freedom uh, before she uh, reaches the end of her indenture. Um, but then another war happens, War of 1812. Again, black troops serve in the United States <coughs> Army uh, for in defense of you know, liberty and freedom, all the things in the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence. And again, a mirror is held up to the state of New York that you are treating your fellow citizens as not equal to you. Uh, so in 1817, and when DeWitt Clinton, the father of the Erie Canal, like the governor, he is going to sign a new act which will free all enslaved people born before July 4th, 1799. Immediately? No, uh, in 10 years. Um, July 4th, 1827. So sometimes in history books you'll see New York State like is one of the first states to abolish slavery in 1799. Uh, that's really not true. They do some legal loopholes kind of make it true, but really the official date for the end of slavery in New York uh, is now commonly accepted as July 5th, uh, 1827. That is when we, for the most part, stop having enslaved people in New York. Though a few, due to various clauses and loopholes in both these two acts, are going to remain enslaved. There will actually be enslaved people in New York into the 1840s, uh, minor numbers. Um, Yep, so like I said, uh, some people born after 1799, they're still going to have to live out their 25-year um, indenture. Simultaneously, uh, as this is happening, uh, people in the New York State Legislature uh, worry about the black vote that is now going to be quote unquote unleashed on them. Uh, they are going to make it so white men can vote with owning no property, while black men will be required to uh, own $250 worth of property, which is a substantial amount at the time. So we are going to meet some people during this talk who will meet that property requirement. Now, if you know anything about the Erie Canal, you'll notice some of those dates towards the end of what I was, that background I was giving, align pretty well with the digging of the Erie Canal constructed between 1817 and 1825. Um, so two years after the canal is completed, slavery is officially abolished in New York. Uh, we do not have any evidence of an enslaved person working on the Erie Canal. Uh, we do have some evidence of uh, African Americans helping to dig the Erie Canal, uh, but their status of whether they were free or enslaved is unknown. Um, there we go. Uh, the first major piece of evidence we have of a black man working on the canal is a gentleman by the name of Solomon Northup, uh, who repaired and navigated the Champlain Canal. Anyone know who Solomon Northup is? Ring any bells? You probably know him because he would later write the book, yes, 12 Years a Slave. Uh, yeah, here he is. Uh, so Solomon Northup is born free uh, on the New York Vermont border, uh, Minerva, New York, it is. Uh, he grows up in New York, uh, and in 12 Years a Slave, he talks about how uh, in the winter of 1830, um, he 
helped his father uh, repair the Champlain Canal, which is connected to the Erie Canal, um, same canal system built simultaneously. Uh, and then he's actually going to end up as a boatman on the canal. Uh, he owns his own boat transporting lumber from Lake Champlain down to Albany, uh, which is a major lumbering center, um, and becomes pretty successful at it. Uh, we see through the Erie Canal's opening, uh, new economic possibilities are open for people of, of all races. Uh, however, Solomon Northup's story, uh, he becomes successful enough as a canal boatman, but eventually it's not really the job of choice for him, so he uh, moves on, eventually becomes he's really into fiddle playing, um, and he will eventually be signed on to work as a fiddle player in a circus in Washington, D.C., at which point he is kidnapped uh, and sold into slavery in Louisiana, um, where he will spend the next 12 years of his life. His experience on the Erie Canal is actually integral in helping him um, legally obtain his freedom again. He can name places like Canajahari and Medina, New York and stuff, things that would be pretty weird for uh, an enslaved person in Louisiana to know. He also is very good at rafting river uh, logs down the Red River because he rafted logs down the Champlain Canal. Um, so eventually he is going to legally obtain uh, his freedom um, after 12 years enslaved, uh, moves back up to Auburn, New York, where he will write the best-selling book, uh, 12 Years a Slave, um, and he's going to travel around the Canal Corridor in the northern United States talking about the horrors of slavery that he saw. Uh, we're going to see Solomon again. Uh, and this is really cool. This was found in the New York State Archives recently. It is a pay voucher for Mintus Northup, his father, that verifies his entire story in 12 Years a Slave about repairing the canal. It has all of the exact uh, documents. Uh, here you'll see Mintus Northup. Uh, so it's assumed uh, he was working uh, under his father who had the contract. Uh, Solomon Northup's a pretty cool story from an uh, interesting story. We can see uh, the Erie Canal offering a bunch of uh, economic potential, but we also see the pervasiveness of slavery. Uh, he is not free of it. Uh, even in New York State, uh, even though he was born a free man, uh, he is still in danger uh, for his, his person. Uh, then, uh, another interesting person is this fellow. This is Thomas James. He was born in Tangerine, New York, around 1907 or 1903, I believe. Uh, Born enslaved, uh, eventually his original uh, master passes away, uh, and he is purchased by another gentleman for some farm equipment, essentially. Um, that man is brutal to him. Uh, in 1819, he escapes and heads towards Canada. He's able to do that by following the newly staked out route of the Erie Canal. Actually interacts, uh, according to his autobiography, with numerous canal workers. Um, and he's going to make it all the way to Lockport, where he's then taken across the Niagara River. Uh, and then actually helps dig the Welland Canal for a year uh, before saying, digging a canal stinks. Uh, and comes back to America. Uh, goes to the uh, new boom town of Rochester, gets a job in a canal side warehouse. Uh, over the winter, he's taught how to read by um, other people working in the canal warehouse with him, and by the end of his career in that warehouse, he will be in charge of their entire freight operations. Um, however, that's not the end of Thomas James' story. Uh, we will meet him again later. Um, so, that's where we're at in around 1830-ish. Um, there isn't really a national anti-slavery uh, movement yet. A lot of northern states have been working on gradual abolition bills similar to what New York passed, uh, but eventually people start advocating for political movements. In 1835, the New York State Anti-Slavery Society is established. This man is integral in it. This is Garrett Smith. Have you ever heard of him? Yes. Garrett Smith 
lives in Peterborough, New York. Uh, he's uh, a billionaire uh, in today's money uh, and supports all of the leading kind of progressive causes of the day. So he's pro-abolition, pro-temperance, uh, pro-women's rights, um, and he has the money to back that up. Um, and New York is going to found the first statewide uh, anti-slavery society. Um, Smith and many other early members are members of the uh, American Colonization Society, uh, but by 1835 they realize that's not going to work. Uh, colonization, sending uh, freed enslaved people back to Africa, they don't want to do it. It's impractical in general. Africans don't want it. And none of it's going to work. Uh, so they try to find, found the New York State Anti-Slavery Society in Utica, another canal city. Uh, however, they are met by an angry mob that storms this church and drives them out of the church. Uh, about 100 of the 300 or so uh, folks hop on a canal boat and head down to Canastota, uh, where they've been invited by Garrett Smith uh, to walk up the hill from Canastota to uh, his hometown of Peterborough, which, as the town's local billionaire, he owns most of it, so they're going to be safe there. Uh, and they meet here uh, in the Smithfield Presbyterian Church, it is now Smithfield Community Center, and the National Abolition Hall of Fame. So that's why that's located there, but it has its interesting canal connection. And we see these riots all over the canal, these anti-slavery riots. Um, <clears throat> So to get a little ahead of myself, Thomas James is going to end up becoming a minister in the AME Zion Church uh, and preaching against anti-slavery. He is driven out of a church uh, in Leroy, uh, right down the road from here. Uh, an angry mob starts throwing rocks and stuff through the windows of that church uh, until he is forced to flee for his life. Um, Garrett Smith and several others in my uh, hometown Ish, uh, from outside of Syracuse, but anyway, uh, in Hanover Square, he's going to try to form um, an anti-slavery society for central New York, again, driven out by angry mobs. And we see this all over the place in the 1830s, uh, but we still see this growing anti-slavery movement. We've got people in these larger ones, but then you'll see uh, women, they start speaking up. In 1837, the Lockport Anti-Slavery Society is founded. It's led by the uh, future wife of a prominent uh, Erie Canal engineer, David Thomas, uh, which is pretty cool. Uh, finally, in 1840, they go straight into politics. The Liberty Party is founded um, in Geneseo, uh, by, in part, by this gentleman. This is Myron Holly. He is the original treasurer of the Erie Canal project. Um, by 1840, he is a die-hard abolitionist, and uh, he's going to become a prominent member of that party early on. Garrett Smith will later run for president under the Liberty Party banner. And they're the first ever political party founded here in upstate New York. Um, well, they're the first national political party, but they're founded right here in upstate New York, uh, fighting on the sole platform of ending slavery in the United States. Uh, we also see the formation of vigilance committees start being made. Uh, prominent among these is this gentleman uh, at the eastern end of the Erie Canal. Uh, this is Stephen Myers. Uh, he and his wife Harriet. So Stephen is going to work on Hudson River steamboats, uh, which are kind of pulling these canal boats down the Hudson uh, to New York City. Uh, but when he's not working on Hudson River steamboats, he's going to be publishing anti-slavery newspapers uh, and organizing vigilance committees which keep their eyes open uh, for freedom seekers traveling towards Canada and helping them out. Uh, also keeping their eye out for slave catchers to you know, alert uh, local populations. So we see there is a movement building here as the 1830s go on. But we also see a lot of resistance uh, to this movement. Um, and there's a good reason for that in New York State. New York City, it's largely a large part of its growing fortune is thanks to Southern cotton, which is supported, of course, by the continued existence of uh, a slave society in the South. And 
you'll see all along the Erie Canal a bunch of cotton mills popping up uh, to, again, use its easy transportation. Um, and that, again, is related to, to slavery. So there is a vested interest along the canal uh, in support of slavery. Uh, a number of other ways people resist, in addition to organized action, uh, they're often influenced by what's known as uh, the Second Great Awakening. This area becomes known as the Burned Over District. Uh, so people start rejecting kind of traditional Calvinist views on predestination uh, and begin embracing a more personalized version of Christianity that says you yourself have a moral obligation to make society better uh, and to address sin within your community, which they see slavery as kind of the great sin in the United States, a lot of people. Uh, so many of these uh, early abolitionist preachers are going to go on to form schools like Oberlin College, but also in Whitesboro, New York, right outside of Rome, the Oneida Institute is founded in uh, the late 1820s. Uh, this is the first ever school that has an in of higher education that has integrated classes. Uh, and a number of the leading abolitionists of the next generation uh, will go to school here, uh, both black and white, uh, including, uh, here's a map of it, there it is, the Whitestown Seminary. Um, including this man, this is Jermaine Wesley Logan. He goes to the United Institute. He is a freedom seeker from Tennessee. Um, comes to the uh, United Institute in Whitesboro and becomes an AME Zion Church minister, and he will eventually gain the nickname, um, what is his nickname? The King of the Underground Railroad. That's it. He lives in Syracuse, New York, and it's estimated he helped uh, between 1 and, and, and 2,000 freedom seekers get to Canada. Um, though he himself, he has offered several times to have his freedom purchased, and he rejects it because it would recognize that slavery is a legitimate thing. Um, Thomas James, who we've previously mentioned, uh, he's going to make quite a bit of money uh, working at that canal side warehouse, but his true calling he's gonna find is the AME Zion Church. Uh, he helps found, uh, build the first one in uh, Rochester. Um, actually, it might be the second one. Um, but and eventually becomes ordained as a minister and spends the rest of his life uh, as a minister in the uh, AME Zion Church. Um, he also, and he'll move all along the canal, he is credited with founding the AME Zion Churches in Rochester, uh, Syracuse, Ithaca, and there's one other town. All of them are canal towns. Eventually he'll get transferred actually to New Bedford, Massachusetts, uh, where he'll meet a young man. Anyone know who that person might be? A recent freedom seeker had just arrived in Massachusetts. Yes, he will meet a young guy named Frederick Douglass who is hesitant to speak in church. Uh, and Thomas James encourages him to talk. Um, and Thomas James is going to change history by doing that because Frederick Douglass We've all heard of him. Uh, he's going to eventually uh, move here to upstate New York Canal Corridor. He recognizes its growing prominence in the abolition movement. Uh, and he's going to set up a newspaper right outside, uh, right about a block away from the Erie Canal. Not, a not about a block away, one block away uh, for the North Star and later the Frederick Douglass Papers, an anti-slavery uh, newspaper. And uh, there, it's not a coincidence, he's setting up that printing shop right next to the Erie Canal because the canal is the super information superhighway of its day. We often compare it to the internet uh, at the Erie Canal Museum. You can take information and spread it so much faster than you ever could uh, beforehand. Um, and he's not the only person making these anti-slavery newspapers and sending them along the canal. We've already talked about Stephen Myers, uh, there's this man, Samuel Ringel Ward, who also goes to the United Institute. Uh, he is uh, a very staunch abolitionist. Um, this other guy is Henry Highland Garnett. Um, and they're all publishing newspapers, traveling around the canal, giving speeches, which is one of the big forms of entertainment of, of the day. Um, 
So, now we move on to actual Underground Railroad activity in New York. Uh, there are Underground Railroad stations throughout New York. Uh, this is an image uh, from the 1930s. It was made uh, during the Depression by, I believe, the WPA. Uh, they interviewed uh, survivors uh, at that point. Obviously, there weren't a ton, but they were able to kind of trace out uh, the typical routes uh, that people would have taken on the Underground Railroad. As you can see, uh, classic route was to go up the Hudson and then through what is now the Erie Canal Corridor, or up where the Oswego Canal is. Uh, also, an alternate route was to go from Philadelphia up to Elmira, and then north. Uh, and Elmira itself had its own canal system uh, hooked up to it. So, there's all those stations throughout the state, and as you can see, major route follows the New York State Canal Corridor. Now this is an important thing to note. The Erie Canal itself, we do not have tons of evidence of transporting freedom seekers. And there's a number of reasons for that. Um, the canal's not a great route for this. It, if you go to any canal community, you'll see the canal goes right through the middle of it. What you're doing is breaking the law. Um, usually you're not gonna wanna you know, sit there right in the middle of a town uh, doing that. Uh, also, canal boats are relatively expensive to travel on. Uh, the canals owned by New York State, who again, have their own law enforcement regularly checking the canal. Um, so it's not that great of a route. We do have some newspaper accounts of uh, people using the Erie Canal as a route uh, of escape to Canada. Uh, and even more frequently, turning up north on the Oswego Canal, uh, one of the major investors of was uh, Garrett Smith, who also owned significant land holdings on the Oswego waterfront. Wasn't that convenient? <laughs> uh, uh, so uh, we believe most people moved primarily by foot, wagon, or increasingly railroads as they became more and more av available. Sadly, um, some of the biggest evidence we have of, of people traveling uh, on the Erie Canal as a means of escape are failed attempts. Because, again, you're not writing newspaper accounts about how you successfully broke the law. You still don't see a lot of those newspaper accounts um, in today's papers, right? Uh, oh, I'm getting ahead of myself, excuse me. Um, I'm, on, I'm in my walking tour boat where I was looking at that. Uh, so, we looked, we saw in the 1830s, things were, there was kind of an even split, even, even a pro-slavery bent towards New York State, but we also start to see progress being made. One of the first big instances, notable national news instances here in upstate New York uh, of Underground Railroad activity along the canal is the Harriet Powell Rescue, which happens in Syracuse. Uh, at this place. This is the Syracuse House. Um, it is a relatively opulent hotel uh, right on the banks of the canal. It would have been right in the heart of Syracuse. Uh, three different presidents stayed in it, I know, as did the Marquis de Lafayette uh, at various points. Uh, so everybody who's everybody who's visiting Syracuse stays in the Syracuse House. Among them is the family of John Davenport, who arrives in Syracuse in October of 1839. Uh, the Davenports, well, John Davenport is uh, a wealthy plantation owner from Mississippi. Uh, his wife, however, was from just outside of Syracuse. They were visiting her family. Uh, and they arrived along with Harriet Powell, who was initially believed uh, to be one of the Powells' daughters. Uh, however, it is quickly discovered that she is actually enslaved, and they stay there at the Syracuse house. This causes a real consternation among the people of Syracuse. Harriet Powell, um, she's believed to possibly be the, the sister of John Davenport, uh, half-sister of John Davenport, again, showing the uh, real cruelties of slavery. Um, but she's incredibly light-skinned. Uh, people think she is white. So this kind of inflames the people of Syracuse more than typically, uh, but Tom Leonard is another freedom seeker who has come to live 
in Syracuse. Uh, he got a job as a boatman uh, before eventually finding another job that was common for black men uh, in upstate New York, which was working in a hotel as a waiter. Uh, he's also one of the leaders of the Underground Railroad in Syracuse. So he works at the uh, Syracuse house. He approaches Harriet uh, about escaping to Canada, which he will eventually agree to. Uh, and on October 8th, 1839, uh, she tosses Tom Leonard uh, a bundle of her clothing out the window of the Syracuse house. Uh, and at a farewell party to the Davenports, uh, she steps outside for a breath of air, uh, so the newspaper report says, and then gets into an awaiting carriage, uh, which heads to Marcellus, New York. Uh, immediately, they stop the packet boat that is headed towards, well, not immediately, about 15 minutes later, the Davenports realize kind of what's happened, that Harriet's not coming back, so they stop the packet boat headed for Oswego, New York, which would give us an indication that the authorities at least suspected canal boats were being used to transport freedom seekers north. Uh, but, like I said, she's not there. She's headed south, uh, rather than north, towards Marcellus. Um, and she moves around southern Onondaga and Madison counties for a while before eventually arriving at Garrett Smith's estate uh, on October 28th. There she will meet uh, the cousin of Garrett Smith. Anybody know who it is? It's a young woman by the name of Elizabeth Cady at the time. Um, she meets uh, Harriet uh, Powell uh, at Garrett Smith's house. They talk for about an hour. And Elizabeth Cady Stanton uh, will write in her autobiography that this meeting was a transformative moment in her life. Um, it made her realize the true horrors of slavery, and uh, also she's going to be an abolitionist first before becoming a women's rights advocate. Um, and after that short stay at the Garrett Smith estate, she's transported north to Kingston, Ontario by wagon. Um, and there she will live out the rest of her life. She lives another uh, 20 years, uh, gets married up there, has six kids, and dies of natural causes in uh, 1859. Um, and there's a pretty major uh, population of, of African Americans in Kingston um, because that's kind of a, a main end point for the Underground Railroad. So, Harry Powell's a freedom seeker who goes all the way to Canada. But throughout this story already, we've met a number of formerly enslaved people who are living openly uh, in upstate New York as having escaped from slavery. Things began to change in 1850. That is when the Fugitive Slave Act is passed. Now there had already been a Fugitive Slave Act passed in 1793, um, but that said you're supposed to return an enslaved person to slavery if you found them. But there wasn't any penalty if you did not do that. So most people just said, not my problem, really. Uh, Fugitive Slave Act, part of the Compromise of 1850, uh, takes away that, that bit of being able to kind of wash your hands. Um, the South demands this as part of this compromise package, uh, and it says uh, that you, if you meet a freedom seeker, are legally obligated to report that person to the authorities, or else you too could be prosecuted under the Fugitive Slave Act. So a lot of these people who are living openly in upstate in the north, in these free states, uh, are now terrified that they could be returned to slavery. Uh, because once things become illegal for people, they're much more likely to actually, you know, if you could face legal consequences for something, you're more likely to, to do whatever's going to keep you from facing those legal compromises, right? So this terrifies. Um, the, the black population of the North, and also enrages the white population of the North. They had kind of built up this general idea that slavery is a Southern problem. It's not our problem, more or less. Um, but now the federal government is making it their problem. They could go to jail uh, for just being complicit in this act of, of slavery. Um, there we go. Uh, also, freedom seekers are going to have no legal rights and uh, practically no evidence is required under this bill to send people away. You could just be accused 
of being formerly enslaved, and you got shipped back down south, uh, according to this law. So what happened to Solomon Northup could happen to a lot more people, and with far less kind of tre treachery and trickery. And uh, that is enacted September 18, 1850. The president is Buffalo's very own Millard Fillmore. So again, we see Northerners being complicit in uh, continuing uh, slavery, uh, including ones from New York State. Now the immediate effect of this um, is that a lot of freedom seekers are going to try to head north to Canada and get away from this new repressive law. Among them is the family of William and Catherine Harris. They had been previously enslaved in South Carolina, were living in Philadelphia, uh, but September of 1850, this law passes, and they immediately began making plans to head to Canada. And they're gonna travel from Philadelphia to Albany in early October of 1850. There, a passage on a canal boat will be uh, purchased for them by Hartwell C. Webster. And they're headed to Rochester. They're then gonna take a steamboat across Lake Ontario to Canada. Sadly, the Harrises will not make it to Rochester. Throughout the trip, they're going to be harassed by both the crew uh, and passengers, telling them that their former enslaver knows they are on the boat and will be waiting for them. Uh, sadly, when they reach Syracuse, um, they, uh, they are convinced that their former enslaver is there and they will attempt suicide, sadly. Um, both of the Harris adults will survive but um, their young child will drown in the canal. Um, and that painting is memorialized at the museum uh, with this, the Madonna of the Canal. So uh, this is a tragic story, but we can see the true horrors of slavery and how people even in New York, well after slavery had been abolished, are still subject to its horrors. Um, other effects of the Fugitive Slave Act, though. Again, like I said, white uh, public opinion is inflamed by the Fugitive Slave Act, forcing them to make it so things like that happen. The New York Tribune called that event the grossest moment in humanity uh, that had ever reached their ears. Um, so people in the North are incredibly mad. More of these vigilance committees are going to be formed. Uh, it's an interesting thing. Uh, after the Fugitive Slave Act is made, uh, there is one gentleman, a prominent citizen in Syracuse, who is leaving the mob that drove Garrett Smith out of Hanover Square, is going to be one of the founding members, leading founding members of the new uh, Syracuse Vigilance Committee against slavery. Uh, the same time period, a guy by the name of William Jerry Harris Henry comes to Syracuse, uh, around 1849, uh, 1850, that winter. He arrives right as these new laws are beginning to be passed from Missouri. He himself is a freedom seeker. In Syracuse, finds work as a cabinet maker and as a cooper, making barrels. Um, he's living in Syracuse when, a few months after the Fugitive Slave Act was passed, on May 26, 1851, Secretary of State Daniel Webster native of New Hampshire, senator eventually from uh, Massachusetts, and secretary of state under New Yorker Miller Fillmore. Uh, he comes by train from Buffalo to Syracuse and delivers a speech on a balcony that is uh, less than a block away from the Erie Canal Museum uh, to a crowd gathered in front of Syracuse's city hall. Uh, and in that speech, he tells the people of New York uh, that the laws of this nation will be executed, and those who do not follow them, it is treason, treason, and nothing but treason. And then he threatens the city of Syracuse, who will see what becomes of those men who want to oppose slavery, what becomes of their sacred uh, lives and honor. He's threatening them, saying, if you do not follow the Fugitive Slave Act, you are traitors to this nation. Uh, so again, you see, Northerners uh, kind of perpetuate uh, this. Um, 
And it's believed he may have known that, and federal agents may have known that Jerry was in Syracuse. Uh, during the Syracuse speech, he also says, we'll see, maybe even during the next major anti-slavery convention here in the city, uh, if you'll really put your money where your mouth is and resist this law. So let's fast forward a few months, literally right around the corner from where Daniel Webster gave his speech. The Liberty Party meets for its state convention on October 1st, 1851. And on noon that day, federal agents arrest Jerry Henry and bring him uh, down the street to the federal judge's office. Uh, news quickly spreads because it's, if you take the walking tour, it's literally two blocks away uh, is where the Liberty Party is meeting. Word quickly goes over to them uh, that Jerry's been taken uh, and about four, 30 to 40 uh, Liberty Party members head over to the federal judge's office. And they begin busting up chairs and benches and stuff, causing enough of a commotion that Jerry is able uh, to get out uh, of the room. Uh, this is his first escape. Uh, however, he's still in his shackles uh, from being arrested. And uh, some accounts say he is crossing over a canal bridge when he is again rearrested. Uh, again, you can see the canal is a pretty visible area uh, in throughout New York State, especially in crowded cities. Uh, and he is returned to Clinton Square, uh, to the city jail, and is kept under the guard of two federal agents. Uh, in addition to the Liberty Party convention, it was also the Onondaga County Fair uh, was being held in Syracuse. So there are a lot of people in town. Also, the Liberty Party, they're able to get the word out. It's 1851, telegraphs exist. They've got the Erie Canal, they've got railroads, spread the word. And a crowd of about 2,000 people gather in Clinton Square, uh, demanding that Jerry be free. Uh, eventually, they'll stop demanding, and they will start doing uh, the whole Jerry needs to be free. The large crowd assaults the prison. Uh, one of the two guards jumps into the canal, breaking his arm. Uh, the other pushes Jerry out the front door, saying, this is not worth it. Um, <laughs> so, that time, Jerry is successfully going to be taken to a safe house in Syracuse, uh, where he lays low for about a month. Then he heads uh, west to Buffalo and eventually makes it uh, to Canada. Um, Twelve people are arrested under the Fugitive Slave Act for helping in this. All but one will be acquitted. Um, the other one, a uh, black man by the name of Enoch Reed, is going to be uh, charged. They pretty much throw out the Fugitive Slave Act. They lower the charge down to something like interfering with an uh, officer. Um, and uh, he will be the only person charged with a single crime. Uh, so, the Jerry Rescue is incredibly important for multiple reasons. It shows that the people of the North uh, and the Canal Corridor will not stand for the Fugitive Slave Act. They will actively resist it. Uh, and also, legally, kind of show that the Fugitive Slave Act was toothless. Uh, Enoch Reed, another interesting note about his life, uh, prior to working as a canal boatman, he had worked on a whaling ship with a gentleman by the name of Herman Melville. <laughs> so, um, yes, author of Moby Dick. Uh, so, um, yeah, it is an incredibly important moment uh, in the uh, civil rights movement. Syracuse, for the next eight years, has this gigantic celebration, Jerry Rescue Day, every October 1st. Um, they, the, the first event uh, sells out um, the, the train station. It's the only, it's the only building in town large enough to accommodate the crowd. Uh, they're going to get the premier speakers of the abolitionist movement show up, including our friend Solomon Northup. He shows up at the 1853 um, thing. Is this, uh, is this still in the Syracuse? This yes, is, this was erected uh, in 2001, this okay. monument. Um, where, where is it? I only ask because I am from Syracuse. So it's right in uh, Clinton Square. Okay. Yep. So, so uh, that was my other question. Clinton Square then is Clinton Square now. Yes. Yep. So uh, the fountain that goes through the middle of Clinton Square now, uh, that follows the exact footprint of the Erie Canal. So as you can see, this monument is built 
right across the street from where the Jerry rescue happened. So this was all happening right on the banks of the Erie Canal. Uh, however, I get this question a ton uh, during the walking tour. Why does why is Jerry Rescue Day not celebrated anymore? Well, they stopped celebrating it in 1859. John Brown's raid had happened. The North was inflamed, and um, John Brown had actually can't remember if he had been executed yet or was about to be executed yet. And Garrett Smith, for one, said, "I am not going to be attending the Jerry Rescue uh, Movement um, party." Nowadays, like John Brown said. The sins of the nation can only be cleansed in blood, um, and that will ultimately be what what happens. Uh, the Civil War will break out in 1861, um, and the Erie Canal and other New York State canals play an important role uh, in the Civil War in that they helped transport supplies. So one of the Union's great advantages was its improved transportation network over the South. Um, Syracuse is often given a lot of credit for producing just massive amounts of salt, um, which having salt's helpful if you got giant armies that you need to feed, um, which the South does not have. Um, also, we have a few accounts of regiments traveling by canal uh, south, um, at least to Elmira. Um, like I said, Elmira has its own um, canal that hooks up to the Erie Canal system and is a major mustering point uh, in New York. Um, and many boatmen enlist. I believe it is the 51st New York. Uh, they're from up around Oswego County. Um, they are composed largely of canal boatmen. Um, and uh, after uh, the Emancipation is signed, uh, recruitment of black soldiers begins in large numbers, uh, the most famous of which is uh, Blanking on the number here. 51st Massachusetts? 54th. 54th. There we go. Thank you. Um, the 54th M Massachusetts Regiment is famous, made famous by the movie Glory. They're the first, technically the second set of, of black troops to see combat. And while it's a Massachusetts Regiment, it's actually made up of soldiers from all over the nation. Again, it was the first really openly recruited black regiment. So. Uh, black soldiers from all around America flock to Boston to enlist, including from New York. Uh, in fact, Frederick Douglass and Jermaine Wesley Logan in March of 1863 give a speech in Syracuse imploring the black men of Syracuse to head out to Boston to enlist in this regiment on March 11th and March 26th. Uh, and uh, luckily, the 54th uh, enlistment papers uh, or its roster are on uh, online and uh, looking at the locations of where uh, members of the 54th listed their residence and their occupations. We estimate that about 17 uh, black soldiers in the 54th uh, were either canal boatmen or had jobs directly related to the Erie Canal, serving there uh, in um, with the 54th. Um, pretty interesting story. By the end of the war, nearly 200,000 uh, African American soldiers will serve in the Union armies fighting against slavery. Um, so, uh, in the end, the Civil War is going to kind of resolve the issue, slash uh, the Reconstruction Amendments of the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment. The 13th officially abolishes slavery uh, after the war. Uh, African Americans are going to continue to play an important role along the canal. We start seeing a lot more uh, black folks working on the canal, often as mule drivers, but we also start seeing black canal boat captains um, on the canal and working in factories alongside the canal. Uh, and um, even to this day, uh, that struggle for equal rights um, continues. And yeah. Uh, that's, that's the end of my tale. Uh, but uh, any questions? Under 70 years later, nothing's changed. If you don't like the law, it's okay to be unruly and violent to for sure. You know, your thoughts on what you want done. Still have to that. Yep. 
Hmm. Yes. Um, well, anyway. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> been a great audience. Uh, please stop by the Erie Canal Museum. We're open every day, 10 to 4. I'm also an author, technically. It's weird to say that. Uh, but this book on the history of the Erie Canal and food, I technically wrote. Not technically, I did write them. Well, I want to thank everyone for coming out tonight, and thank you, Derek, for making the trip out to us. Yes, uh, it's a wonderful you. presentation. Uh, just a quick little update on upcoming events. Tomorrow night is our next trivia night. Uh, it's on the Battle of Little Bighorn, or Custer's Last Stand, or there's a number of different names. Uh, that's at 7 o'clock. We have a concert next Thursday. The Jimmy Likes Trio will be playing at 7 o'clock for a couple hours here. And they play all sorts of different kinds of music. Uh, you can find them on YouTube and check out their website and things and get yourself j all jazzed up for it. Uh, and then we have our next Java with Joe the following Thursday the 23rd in the morning at 9 a.m. Uh, Genesee Area Genealogists will be presenting. So we can all learn a little bit more about studying our family trees. And then the following, th everything's on Thursday this month, so just, uh, just come by on a Thursday, there's something going on. Uh, so the, the 30th, I'll actually be presenting uh, the next guest speaker series, so I guess it's not technically a guest speaker, but uh, just a speaker. Uh, so that, uh, it's called Joseph Ellicott's Ghost. It's about uh, the lasting impact of the Holland Land Company, so how you can still see uh, what's been left behind 200 years later. So that's everything coming up in the next month, but there's more after that as well, but I don't want to overload anybody. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah.